um, based off of quite a few questions I got last week. Um, some of the questions uh, I really uh, got were pertaining to specifically HIPAA and HIPAA regulations regarding legalities. Are we covered using some of these platforms and formats? And that's going to be um, probably uh, the first half of our session. And after that, set, uh, I got additional questions regarding how to set up your lighting, audio, uh, things of that nature, just uh, some problem shoot, troubleshooting and how to set up your formats and programs to work with your clients. Also other things di different. I also listed several different types of uh, forums or platforms that you can utilize in, in disseminating the remote. And I refer to it as teletherapy or remote therapy, telehealth, various names that are assigned to it. As you all know, because we are uh, Medi-Cal uh, folks, uh, we, are, we fall under the parameters of, of being considered health professionals. So without further ado, I'm going to uh, begin our presentation. Okay, here we go to begin. Um, kind of just kind of go over some things, and I think all of you guys may already be familiar with what is exactly is HIPAA. Yeah, Health Insurance Portability Act. It was passed uh, several years ago, back in 1996, and the prime reason for passing HIPAA was um, support folks privacy with their information with medical agencies. A lot of things that we do are, are recorded, reported, and kept on file. HIPAA is an agency that requires that this information be confidential. As well. Can mute their phone? Yeah, hi, Kevin. Yes. Sorry, Kevin. Can, um, I, we need everybody to mute their phones. We, can, we can't hear you very well. We Unless we put everybody else on mute and then you do star six so that you're the only one unmuted, that could work as well. Oh, I, yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm hearing a lot of folks talking in the background. It could possibly be that. Mm -hmm. um, can you hear me? Yes, now I can hear you much better. Thank you so much. Let's see. Um, I'm also going to maybe see if I can make an audio adjustment, but um, I checked before, and that's going to be one of the things I speak about today. <laughs> um, you know, so uh, if, if you cannot hear me, please uh, send me a note and let me know so I can uh, make some adjustments, please. <clears throat> No, I also received some text messages uh, and emails last week from uh, intern students and people that are in, in the interim stages of their program for school psychology, and uh, they may not have some of this information, so I won't inundate us, but I did want to touch on that. Moving on, um, HIPAA compliance. What is actually being HIPAA compliant mean? Um, there are certain platforms that are technically not HIPAA compliant. In order for a program to be HIPAA compliant, it must meet three criteria. It must be encrypted, uh, meaning that the data is protected and it can't be accessed. Um, it, it also, you also have to sign what's called a business associate agreement with the particular remote agency that you are disseminating services on. Uh, and there are, and I will get to those agencies that are actually HIPAA compliant, but I have some good news too. Uh, regarding compliance, and I'll get to that in a moment. Also, the agency must monitor for breaches, kind of like uh, Equifax and uh, some of the um, credit monitoring agencies that check. Uh, I actually have uh, an account with one of the agencies. They actually send me monthly notifications as they monitor for people breaching or try to use my social security number or hack it to my accounts. So down at the bottom, I, I have listed websites also for uh, you guys to, read, to to peruse and visit and read more in depth about these things on your own time. But again, it must meet three criteria, encryption, business associates agreement, which we call BAAs, 
and monitoring for these breaches. And these three things you can check if, for example, with Zoom, Zoom is one that is actually HIPAA compliant and it meets all three of these criterias. And, I, and in fact, I read an article yesterday that said they have quadrupled uh, in the number of people using their platform since the uh, coronavirus uh, epidemic has, has started. Moving on to our next um, sticky, uh, OCR, which is the um, Office of Civil Rights, has recently lifted what uh, HIPAA has uh, suggested we, they used to need for compliance. And then I won't read this verbatim, but it will not impose penalties for non-compliance with HIPAA regulations during this COVID-19 pandemic. So that's the good news for I, at least, I had at least 20 questions last week from people saying, are these platforms uh, HIPAA compliant? Do they meet the requirements for being able to uh, not be sued by someone? And again, I always say, if you have any doubts about anything, by all means, always, use your best professional judgment. I, I always like to check in with colleagues and collaborate and talk to people. And this is a good forum for doing that to say, hey, are we covered here? They will not impose uh, those penalties at all during this particular period. And they also have advised that they will alert us in due, in due time to uh, let us know when we need to be HIPAA compliant. But as it stands in that link at the bottom, ties directly into the Department of Health and Human Services, and you will see the notification, and it also covers other things in addition to HIPAA compliance, uh, but it also talks about things that I think we all should know uh, regarding remote and teletherapy services. The next sticky is just a basic HIPAA compliant uh, formats, uh, formats that are sanctioned by HIPAA and can be used by HIPAA. I've actually put a couple of views up of some of the different sites so you can see how they look. Um, Zoom, DoxyMe, Google Hangouts, Google Suite Hangouts, Skype for Business, UpDocs. And I've read you know, quite a bit about and looked at some of these platforms and heard quite a bit from uh, people about them. And uh, Zoom seems to be the one that is preferred by most people uh, because it's very seamless. It has a lot of different features oh, okay. and you can navigate it relatively easily. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm kind of a, letter, small letter or uh, I consider myself letter? to be an elder now. I've been around for a while and I have had to evolve and, 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 and grow. Uh, particular uh, forms and they are awesome. And I like personally, my, the one that I prefer to use is Zoom. I, I've been using it uh, for many years. Uh, when I began doing remote teletherapy back in uh, 2015, and um, I actually love it, and it's very good. You can present your reports on it. You can uh, do YouTube videos on it. There's a lot of various things that it allows you to do, and I encourage Zoom. Again, uh, make sure your, most school districts that are using it as a whole have pretty much done the BAAs as far as I've been told by the districts that I've worked with. But I would, if you're concerned about it uh, and you don't need to be right now, this law was actually passed on October 13th, excuse me, March 13th, uh, where OCR, uh, the Office of um, Civil Rights said, we're gonna give, your, give your, everyone a pass on utilizing the, the video platforms because they know some of them are not HIPAA compliant, and they realize the need right now. And and as I stated, uh, Zoom says they had uh, have quadrupled almost with uh, uh, clients since the uh, coronavirus has taken over. <clears throat> Moving on to our now, I'm going to kind of segue. This is a little bit more about when sessions online go glitchy. What can we do to prevent them from going glitchy? Glitchy meaning cutting out on you, your computer shuts down and starts doing an update, uh, <laughs> you get a phone call in the middle of a session, things of that nature, the stuff that you just don't think about, you got your phone in your pocket, you're, you're going to a meeting and all of a sudden your phone rings. Uh, these are the kind of things that uh, the, the last part of the presentation will be kind of going into depth a little bit about, talk about how to light your room. Uh, I actually put, in, put a um, background up today behind me 
uh, to kind of share, but that, that particular background can be distracting. So you have to consider the clientele that you're working with. Um, I'm speaking not on my headset today. Um, my son actually uh, was at the um, last webinar that I did and he said it looked like I was playing video games. And I did get those headphones specifically because I was uh, working with a lot of uh, elementary age and middle, high, middle school students and they used to get a really good kick out of it. In addition to that, you know, they, lo they loved my headphones and part of my motivating students to stay in touch with me was if we had a good session, if you give me a good 15 minutes on this evaluation today, uh, we'll play uh, either a video game together, which you can do on this platform. I'll down, uh, I also have played games such as uh, Connect Four with students. There's various games that you can access and uh, I also have other motivators, not necessarily games that you can use with students. Uh, some of my kids like to watch uh, animal videos, but there are several things that you can do with these video platforms to help keep students motivated and keep their attention while working with them. So without further ado, let's go into uh, when sessions do go glitchy, what are some things that we need to look for? First of all, you yeah. should do a checklist. We should have like a pre-session checklist that we do can Before I, we begin our day uh, counseling students or doing evaluations online, uh, first of all, you need to quit all programs. You close your Chrome, close your emails, close all your box, anything that you have open. I'm encouraging you to close it if you don't need it. The only thing that I currently have open is my Zoom app and the app that I'm sharing with you, my uh, Prexy app. Uh, I, if you close I, all those yeah. things, it will help minimize uh, Wi-Fi pulling on stuff and it just makes a smoother, more seamless uh, remote session. Uh, I also encourage, if you are able to, to make a direct connection to your Wi-Fi router with the cable. Um, this has been one of the biggest problems uh, that uh, therapists have mentioned to me is that, ah, oh, uh, I can't, uh, I, I got a bad connection. My lips are not in sync with, uh, when I'm talking, I can see it on the mirror. The kid's delayed when he talks. You don't have a lot of control over the Wi-Fi on the other end, but if your Wi-Fi is very strong, um, traditionally I haven't had very many problems with folks on the other end. Uh, also, uh, this is the, the, kind of what I mentioned earlier, make sure your antivirus programs or your system updates aren't scheduled to run during your session. And I know that sounds a little uh, odd, but it has happened to me, especially with, I have micro, uh, excuse me, Windows and, um, Windows often does updates and sometimes they don't ask if you want them to do it. So I literally had to go into my computer, go to my uh, settings and uh, turn off automatic updates because it would make an update right in the middle of the session. And once it gets started, it takes uh, quite a bit to stop it. So again, uh, make sure that you uh, turn those puppies off. Um, have Hi, Kevin. Can you yes, hear me? Yes. Sorry, I unmuted just myself, you guys. No one else is unmuted. Um, your slides are cut off. Is there, are you sharing your screen by chance? We can only see like part of it. We're missing the, the left side you, the right left now, side, but we were missing the right side earlier as well. About now, uh, you know what happened because this, I think it has to do with the uh, pictures that are up of everyone. I can, I can minimize that though. How about yeah, now? Yeah, or reshape oh. in some sort. No, it's still cut off. Let me, let me try it. Let's try it again. Um, what about now? No, nope, it's weird. Yeah. We're only getting, can you um, reshare your screen? I can. I'll try, stop the share. Let's and try I'll that reshare. again. Yeah. Okay. Sorry guys. I know we have a lot of people are asking in the chat box. So I figured I would unmute myself and try to see if we can get it. There we go. Perfect. Thank you so, so how, much. Would you like me to go back to a slide or two or is that okay? No. Okay. Um, can somebody in the chat box, would you guys like to go back a chat or two? I'm going to give I it a second to see. I can't see the chat box from this view, but. No, you're good. Don't even worry. I'm looking at it. Okay. No one said that they would like to go back a uh, slide or two so we can start from here. Thank okay. you so much, Kevin. Oh, no worries. Actually, we're going to move on to the next slide now. Um, some, some best practices with the, ch with the checklist. Uh, and it's, these things are, you know, even though it may seem to be a little self-explanatory or uh, some of these things are things that we don't think about but should be used. If, I, I actually, uh, in my office that I'm in right now, I have two windows on the side of me 
and and during this time of the day, uh, the the sun is beaming into this room. Uh, and just to try to, I don't know if you, if I opened it up now, uh, it really gives a a bad lighting to the room. So I have to close these blinds very tightly. And um, oftentimes, if it's raining outside, I still have to close them. But then I'll put a light either be behind me or in front of me. There's three different types of lighting that they talk about. The key light is the main light to illuminate you. Traditionally, that light I put behind me. Uh, the field light is a secondary light. And then, of course, there's your backlight. The backlight I, I like more so than any of the other lighting because it, it gives a really mellow hue. I prefer to put it low and directly behind me. Uh, the gentleman up in the top corner, as you see, has the windows open, very bright lighting, but it's kind of a, an example of how you can have a brighter light or a more, more dim room, if you like. The use of natural light is, is always better if you can, if you can use that. Um, and, I, and as you see, that's what I do. If I'm doing a late night session, because again, I'm, now I'm in Texas, and if I'm working in, in, on the East Coast, or, uh, and it's dark there already, and my room will be dark too, this is when I have to use lighting. Um, the, if you can, you should try and have the window in front of you because uh, again, it, the, the computer screen will block the bulk of the light on your face, but you still will have a very good lighting. Um, and be familiar with the teletherapy platform that you're using. If you, do not, if you don't like Zoom and you feel more comfortable with Google Suites or if you like, they, they really don't encourage Skype because Skype actually, um, saves and stores some of the information that you put up. So I'll be very careful about it, even though there is a waiver and there's no liability because they, as I said earlier, have, have suspended any type of uh, uh, penalties for using any of the forms currently. I would still be very careful because as you know, we have our own confidentiality laws that we must be concerned with. And of course, confidentiality is, is really key in the special education form. So I would just hate to have to go through any logistics of trying to prove that, hey, I was doing the best I could at the time. Uh, the, the Department of Health and Human Services said that we could use Skype. So this is what I use. When I know there are platforms out there that I can use that are HIPAA compliant. So I'm encouraging uh, you guys all to just try to stay with one that you know that's, that works for you. But I would try to stay within the parameters of the HIPAA compliance. Um, and of course, the webcam. The webcam placement is uh, very important. Uh, and the next slide will go into a little bit more depth about that. Uh, I am sitting very low in comparison to my computer screen because I have a, a low chair. So I have to adjust my camera down to make it look as though I'm sitting parallel to the screen. Um, and as I said, the next slide will show us a little bit more about that. <clears throat> uh, in our continuation and the very at the very top you can see the gentleman on the picture the webcam is looking it's kind of angled down but he's up high so he's looking down the webcam is actually too low and he, and accordingly he doesn't have the light that he needs here the webcam has been adjusted up to eye level and he also has input two of these little lights in the back i actually uh, bought a couple of these years ago to barbecue outside i paid uh like five bucks a piece for them at Lowe's. And I just put a, a 60 watt bulb in them. And uh, they have clips on them like you see on the camera. And I clipped them to either side of my um, desk and, and my computer room. And it really gave me very good lighting because I was counseling back, I said back east. And a lot of my cases were late in the evening, like 6 p.m., 7 p.m. So I needed the extra lighting. Um, avoid distracting backgrounds. Uh, in my office, I have um, uh, LSU flags, New Orleans Saints flags, uh, you know, I have various distracting things up on my wall in my office. So uh, oftentimes, depending on uh, what group, age group I'm working with, I also have a white screen that I put up behind me sometimes. Um, it doesn't do much for my skin tones and hues, and I look a little odd on the camera. So. Uh, Zoom did not have the uh, re, uh, virtual backgrounds when I initially started using them. So I experimented with different types of things. I hung uh, solid black sheets on, uh, on the whiteboard. I tried various things to block out the background. You must 
figure out what works for you and what works for your clientele. Uh, but once again, avoiding distracting backgrounds is kind of key, especially if you work with young kids. Um, use external microphones whenever available. Um, and that's what I had, the, the headset. I did see uh, several folks, uh, my last um, webinar were using uh, the headphones and I encourage it and I do use them, but I want to see today how it would be without it. And uh, already um, Geneva has let me know and I think uh, that she couldn't hear me very well. You guys couldn't hear me very well. So this, this shows me that uh, I prefer a headset. Um, you do what works for you, but uh, again, a best practice is to use the external microphone. Uh, also audio placement before we start it. Uh, as you can see, when, when everybody's not muted, you'd be surprised some of the things that you hear uh, in the background. Uh, uh, kids come in asking for mommy, mommy, I need to go do A, B, C, D, E, F, G. You hear dogs barking. Uh, actually, I have to make uh, serious arrangements at my home. I have three dogs and they hate when I'm in a room and the door's closed. They will actually scratch on the door, bark, let me in. So I have to, uh, I have to embark upon my wife to help me keep the dogs away from my office when I'm working. Uh, and these are things that you just should be aware of. Um, audio placement, there's an audio adjustment. You can turn your volume up, you can turn your volume down. You can mute yourself as you all, as I see a lot of people have muted their picture, muted their audio. And you know, these, this, these are things that you should consider and do. And I, I think they're great. Again, make sure your volume is loud enough to hear, but not loud enough to pick up that background. I think uh, earlier um, when um, Mar Maria was speaking, you could hear a little uh, feedback. When you start to hear feedback or you can hear feedback, it's always good to turn your, your volume down a bit. Um, and uh, that makes the feedback kind of drop off. It may be times where you need to reboot. Uh, of course, you just let your client know and say, hey, we're gonna try this again. Uh, let me reboot and uh, I'll call you back uh, and we'll pick, uh, pick up the session. <clears throat> now we're gonna kind of move into in review. Today we discussed HIPAA and the Insurance Portability Act and what that means uh, that they are actually uh, been in business since 1996 and they're responsible for the privacy of and confidentiality of data in the health organizations. Uh, the guidelines that relate to HIPAA teletherapy are of course encryption, the BAAs or the business associate agreements that we discussed and also that they monitor for breaches. Uh, you can either call and contact you don't necessarily need to have a, a, a paid program either. A lot of these uh, platforms are free, but I've found that the really good ones are, you know, 19 bucks a month or so or, or up, uh, depending on what you need them for, what you're trying to utilize them for. Traditionally, most agencies that you work for have the uh, forms or the platforms for you that they sanction and want to use with their businesses. So if you have difficulties or questions or concerns, by all means, always reach out to the agency or the school districts that you're working with to find out, you know, what legal ramifications there are for us. Because I am aware that anytime there is a, uh, a suit, sometimes uh, in particular working as a 1099 employee, you must have your own insurance and you are the one who's going to be liable. So make sure that these guidelines are, uh, you know, that you're covered. Uh, Department of Health and Human Services has also imposed that there will be no penalties for non-compliance of HIPAA regulations during this COVID outbreak. Uh, I check and I put those links there for you to check. I encourage you to check and stay in tune. Uh, there's a lot of scuttlebutt about the possibility of schools going back on, on, on ground in the fall. Uh, of course, we don't know that to be in fact, but um, just keep in mind that if it does, that uh, there, there may be some school districts that do and some school districts that don't, but I think you should just check that website periodically to see if the, um, no, if the waiver is still in, in, intact. Uh, I've, we also discussed several vendors that are able to provide these co uh, compliant communication products. So, you know, if you've got one that works for you, you wanna try one that you think might work better for you, uh, it may work on you in where you are in California or Oregon, but it may not work as well in Texas or Georgia. So you also can work with your client to help them find 
a platform that works for both of you. Um, <clears throat> uh, we went over a little checklist of things, the audio, the video, your room that you're working in, your background, um, and noise, things of that nature. And these are things that you should do before your session starts, at least uh, 30 minutes to an hour before your session starts. I, I come in, turn my computer on, or align my camera, check my volume on my speakers, uh, make sure that I'm sitting in a proper location that I would like to be seen in and that everyone can see or hear me. Uh, sometimes I'll even call a colleague and say, hey, let's, let's do a little Zoom session real quick so I can check things out and you can see what I see, uh, how I look, how it sounds to you. And lastly, we went over some technical requirements like the location of your, 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 where you're sitting, the location of your computer, types of content necessary to create an engaging teletherapy session. Uh, I, I have uh, a wealth of resources for you guys uh, to um, work with your clients in the capacity that they feel comfortable and to motivate them, to keep them engaged, to give them so, uh, a break uh, and to bring them back in where you can start back up with your sessions and, and be off and running without having to uh, really engage the student because it is a little bit more difficult once you lose your student on the teletherapy platform as, as opposed to when you work with that student in person. You know, if you're working with a student in person, you know, you, you can get up and let them walk around outside, get a little bit of fresh air, uh, take a five, 10 minute break, go use the restroom and you come back into your session and let's get started. When you're doing a teletherapy, you don't have anybody on the other end that can really help you okay, let's walk around for five minutes and come back and start our session. Uh, it's a little different when they're at home. So I want to encourage you to be aware that uh, it is a little bit different uh, doing the uh, remote counseling than uh, doing it online. And again, uh, if you have, please uh, email me any questions that you may have regarding anything about remote therapy. I'm trying to put things together Initially based on, I did it based on the law legalities and uh, what the law says that we must do. Today we talked, I answered quite a few questions regarding uh, platforms that can be used, HIPAA compliance. And then I want to give you a little bit about how to make sure you have a very good remote session and uh, everyone can see here and, and, and communicate. And, and, if, and provided uh, I'm able to, I have also have another presentation I'm working on it talks about motivating kids and it has uh, platforms that you can use to, to help keep them motivated and keep working with them so that you and your client too can have some successes. And that said, that kind of concludes the presentation. I wanted to see if there were any questions, please. Put it out. If you guys want to unmute yourselves, you can just do star six and unmute yourselves to ask questions. Hi, Kevin. There are some in the chat box as well, Kevin. Okay, yes, I've just scrolled down to that chat box. Okay. Hi, Kevin, can you hear me? I can. Okay, hi, hi. this is Renita Davis. I'm the, uh, I'm a, a what am I? Oh gosh, I just got a new title and I forgot what it is. But anyway, <laughs> um, student services coordinator. Okay. Um, I came in late, so my apologies, but you talked about a waiver for HIPAA. Yes, ma'am. Um, there's been a concern that um, doing teletherapy that, you know, that there's a violation of privacy and all of that. And I've been kind of searching and I haven't really seen anything that um, addresses that. Um, okay. There is, in fact, and I, uh, the link is actually a, attached to the bottom of the slide where it says OCR, um, OCR compliance uh, regulations. Uh, if you, let's see if I can bring it back up and show it to you, if it's okay here. I'll show you, Ms. Davis. Okay. All right, let me go back and share that with you. This particular slide right here. At the bottom is the website that you can go to where it will give you all of this information right here. Department of Human Health, Department of Health and Human Services uh, is the head department and Office of Civil Rights falls underneath it. 
and they said they will not impose penalties for noncompliance during the COVID-19 outbreak for leveraging teletherapy platforms that may not comply with privacy rules. Uh, OCR will not impose penalties for those entities that use these tools during the pandemic. And they said that it relates to good faith provision of teletherapy services and there will be no penalties. So this is the website that you can use to help substantiate that information, Ms. Davis, down below. Uh, and that uh, they're going to post this um, webinar on, on the uh, Travelers Therapy, Therapy Travelers website, excuse me. And uh, you will be able to copy that web, web link if you don't have it now. Or just, just go online and type in Department of Health and Human Services um, waiver for um, non-compliance, HIPAA non-compliance, and it'll, it'll bring that website up for you. All right, thank you so much. Mm -hmm, thank you for your question. I have a question. Yes, Ms. Jordan, is it Ms. Jordan? Yeah, Emily Jordan, hi. Hi. Um, I'm a school psychologist. So um, I understand about HIPAA, but I'm wondering yes. about FERPA because that, applies to educational settings and confidentiality. Yes, ma'am. I did, a, my, I did a, uh, actually the webinar I did last week, I addressed FERPA. I can actually go to that if you like and bring it up for you uh, briefly. Let's see here, let me get to it. This was the first webinar that I did. Let me go back and for you. Here we go. Okay. All right, here we go. I'm going to get it, get to that slide and I'll screen share it with you and let you see, ma'am. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Trying to, I'm just going to scrolling through, trying to get to this right screen. It takes a sec. And and that's a great question, but FERPA is also has some definitive. Um, and here's the and here I'm going to share it with you right now. At the top of this slide, you see the FERPA. Uh, and how FERPA is uh, dealing with the coronavirus. And this, this, is, this page actually cuts off. I just wanted to post a little bit of it so folks can see that this is actually a uh, federal and uh, national website. Uh, this is the link for it above. If you click on here, it will give you the, definitively the answers regarding, excuse me, regarding student privacy policies and how it pertains to FERPA and our our role and, and, and what we must or must not do in regarding student records. And again, because of the COVID virus and this being uh, something unprecedented and new, they are still juggling things. And that's a very good question that you asked, but as it stands right now, um, we are covered. And again, um, that's why I posted the link on my last uh, uh, webinar and I encourage you to go back and take a peep at that because it also has other things that I covered regarding the California Department of Education, the federal IDEA laws, FERPA laws, the, edu uh, the Elementary and Secondary Educational Act, in addition to what NAS is saying about uh, remote teletherapy. And these are actually all of them. I have up the, the websites that you can go to where it gives you all the information, all of the resources that you would need to be able to uh, make informed decisions and also professional judgments regarding what you should and should not do regarding your teletherapy sessions. So this is a very good slide to go to. Um, again, I, I know they posted this on the website. So if you just go back, I think it's the second or third link on the uh, webinar page, and it will give you all of these links. They're all at the top of the page. It will give you all of the links that you can go to 
to question and have it with any questions or concerns regarding any of these entities and your laws regarding your rights and uh, protections regarding uh, the COVID virus thing that's going on right now. Did so, I answer your question, Ms. Davis? No, go ahead. Ms. So, I, so just to follow up, um, so my understanding from NASP and CASP out here in California is mm -hmm. that we're recommending that our school district have a business association agreement with our platform. That is what I would like to have, but as I stated earlier, there's been a waiver from um, the Office of Civil Rights that says that you can use any platform at this point. But I personally, being the person that I am, uh, I would prefer to use something that I know meets the criteria that HIPAA has, the, uh, F the um, BAA, the Business Associate Agreement, that the site is encrypted because Skype is actually not, and also that they do um, data monitoring of, for breaches. And if it meets those three, as I said, which Zoom does, then you are covered as far as HIPAA compliance is concerned. You can always call HIPAA and, I mean, excuse me, always call the particular platform if you're using Zoom. You can get customer service. You can do it either chat or telephonically. Say, hey, are you HIPAA compliant? <laughs> and, it's, and say, do you do this? Do you do that? And do you do this? ABC, encryption, FAA, BAA, excuse me, and, uh, and are you monitoring for breaches? And if they say yes on all three, then you are covered. If they say no, you're quote unquote technically covered by uh, OCR. However, you know, like I do, we uh, are bound to confidentiality. If you have any apprehensions about the platform, I wouldn't use it personally. I would not use it. Thank you. You're welcome, Ms. Jordan. Thank you for your question. I have a question. Yes, Ms. Hand. Um, I'm, I'm looking at the website and I'm having difficulty finding the slides and your resources. I wonder if you could walk us through how to get those? On the, on the traveler the traveler site, you having difficulties finding the I'm, Yes, I'm on the therapy traveler site and over on the hamburger button on the side, there's a remote resources. Um, I can help with that. So if you go to therapytravelers.com um, and you go under remote resources and under you, so you scroll on that, it's going to say videos, webinars, click on webinars. And there's a list of all of the webinars we've done. Um, Kevin's is the second one down, tips and tools that school psychologists can use in teletherapy. And you can view the recordings from there. We also and have speech therapy webinars in there as well. Will that have the, uh, the slide? presentation with the links involved? Um, I think the slides are under, if you do the same thing, remote resources, and then you go underneath Margaret's corner, it'll say handouts and presentations. And if that is not in there, uh, if his slides are not in there, we can get them in there um, hopefully by the end of today, if not by Monday. Is there a specific name that we should be looking for? There's not a tips and tricks. Yeah, I don't see his in there from last week. I'll make sure that those get added okay, in there. Okay, thank you. It'll, it'll say school psychology. Okay, thank you very much. All right. You're very welcome. Question. Were there any other questions, please? Let me look in the chat and see what I have. Do you ever have problems with Zoom bombers popping in and disrupting? I've heard about it on the news. How do you keep that from happening? I've heard there are securities, but don't know how they work. I've been using Zoom for many, many years, and I have never had anyone pop into a session. And I think that's where the encryption comes into play. If you're not invited, and this question came from Ms. Han again. Um, I don't, I've never had that problem, Ms. Han. And, um, I have not had anyone to say that they too have had this problem, but if, if, I, if you're concerned about that, I would be definitively talk to the platform that you're trying to use and, and speak with them about it. Um, I have never seen or heard anything about that one. <laughs> 
I know that uh, my district for that issue is requiring anyone who's using Zoom to have the waiting room feature on because then if people, hackers, try to get in, you can see them ahead of time before they're actually in and you can kind of determine if there's someone you want in the meeting or not. Right, right. Well, and I do there know- was a security he, feature that was added, I think, by Zoom recently. Recently. And it's called, what is it called? I'm sorry. It's like the waiting room feature and then you can put passwords in too. I so see. Multiple security measures you can put in place when you set up meetings for that reason. Okay, and thank you for that because I, that's a new one to me. And I honestly, I've been, like I said, I've been doing this since uh, remote therapy since 2015. And I have never had uh, anyone come into my meeting uh, that was not invited. And, and that's kind of where that invite and ID number comes in. Now, if that, now if someone hacks into your email and, uh, and uh, you know, takes that information, then by all means, I'm sure they could, you know, hack into your meeting, but I have never had that happen in all my years of doing it. Um, if you go to the Zoom website, uh, they have a list of recommendations to maximize the privacy and security. I know that this has been a big issue with school districts, but Zoom has been making updates uh, for the past couple of weeks. And with every update, they also put out recommendations on their website. Well, thank you, Margaret. How are you? Thanks for that input. <laughs> How you doing? <laughs> Wonderful. Um, thank you. Great. Thank you for that. Thank you for your input. Um, someone said they had a pop-up done through Zoom with 200 participants. Porn popped up during the session. That was two weeks ago. Zoom was able to shut it down immediately. And there you have it. And I'm sure, uh, yes, that if, if that kind of, it's, I was watching, um, I watch uh, uh, quite a few uh, live uh videos on YouTube. And I do know that uh, the presenters always have unwanted people popping into their, their rooms and they are able to also uh, shut them down and block them from being able to access the meeting again. So I, as I've never had that problem, um, I have not had to deal with it. Uh, you've got a couple uh, of our colleagues uh, who have sp spoken on it. So again, Ms. Han, if that's a problem, uh, I would, I would contact the platform provider that you're working with to see what can be done about it in the past, excuse me, in the future. Okay, did anybody have any other questions? Well, I, I could actually, um, I do have a couple of resources that I'd like to share with you all if, um, if you'd like to see it. Um, <laughs> I, I uh, don't know how much time we have left, uh, Ms. Geneva, but um, I, could, I could actually share a couple of resources with the uh, folks if we have time. Got up early, and um, hold on a second. Hello. Yes. Hello. Hello. Yes. I'm sorry, I got a notification that you wanted me to unmute my phone. I mean, my, uh, maybe that was for somebody else. I'm I sorry. Think it, who, I think it may have been. It, it wasn't I. Okay. No worries. All right, I'll mute back. Uh, no problem, Ms. Davis. <laughs> I'm actually looking for a video to share with you guys. Not a video, a, um, a link that I have of uh, some, some resources that I think you could all benefit from to help keep your students engaged while you're doing your therapy sessions. Um, let's see here. Kevin, do you have, do you ever do testing uh, remotely? Oh, yes, indeed. Uh, quite a bit. I do. Do you have resources for how to do that um, in a standardized form? Um, not, not in a standardized form. It's, okay, and, and if I may, doing an evaluation online is similar to doing an evaluation on ground, we call it. Uh, you know, you, of course, you have your riot procedures, you do your record reviews, your interviews, your observations, and then you do your testing. It's no different. Um, 
the the difficulty or where you where you find some difficulties and you will you guys will for sure um is getting the record reviews uh, right now during school shutdown uh in south san francisco where i was working lastly they actually had clerical staff coming in uh twice a week so we were able to contact clerical staff via email ask them if they would scan and copy uh the CUNE file <laughs> as, uh, and of course you can always, if the student is as an existing IEP, all of those records on, on, on SACE per se, or whatever format you use for special ed, what city or state you're in, whatever special education information system you are, should have all the students' previous IEPs, should have all their um, triennial reports, speech and language reports and things of that nature. You guys know like I do, Quite a quite a bit of uh, time when you look in these files, those things are not there. You can't find them anyway. So the logistics are pretty much the same. Uh, then you move on to your interviews. They can either be done on telephone or you can do them via Zoom app. Um, easy breezy. No, never had any problems with that. Um, so that covers our record review and our interview. The observations. I had a question about that last week. Um, that would be a little bit more difficult in the home. I shared with folks last week when doing initial evaluations, if you're unable to do uh, observations across the curriculum, I like to do one in the classroom, one at recess, one at PE, one in the cafeteria. I normally do three on an initial and I'll find the areas that the teacher or parent is having concerns where the kid is having more difficulties if it's behavioral. Um, if, and if it's not behavioral, I'll just do classroom, recess and lunchroom. Um, that way you can see how students and inter interact socially, how they do in the classroom for academics and how they do outside on the playground. Um, and here's where the problem traditionally comes, is gonna come in for us now, is doing our testing um, with initials or with any tries. Only thing that I would accept now is, is rating scales, um, I don't see how you would be able to effectively give a cognitive measure or an academic measure if you do um, without having the document cam. Uh, when I was doing remote therapy, there was a procedure we had in place where we had an online on-site person who would set up the document cams for me and they would also quote unquote, I'm going to use the word proctor. And when I say proctor, I don't mean that they uh, were involved in the testing process but they were there to see to it that the materials were handed out to the student, uh, that, that the student stopped when I told them to stop writing, stop drawing, uh, whatever it was that they were doing in the, in the interim. And it worked a lot smoother that way. As far as doing remotely now without having the ability to have someone act as that proctor for you, uh, that has not happened yet. I actually, as I said, was working in South San Francisco when this COVID thing hit. And we actually uh, we actually started on the 13th of uh, March being, uh, what do they call it? Um, sheltering in place, quarantining or whatever you want to call it. So I was in my apartment uh, from the 13th of March and I was doing basically the first three record reviews, interviews, and I did some observations. With my initials, I was unable to do any testing. Um, if I had an ADHD kid, nine times out of 10, the teacher had already done the academic testing. Uh, I would do the uh, BASC or I would do a Connors and a BASC. Um, and of course, we didn't need any cognitive data at that point. So we were able to move forward with that triennial because we had enough in the file. We had the testing rating skills that we needed to get done and everything else went status quo. However, with an initial where you're doing brand new kid, you have to have that cognitive testing. It's very difficult to do uh, without that proctor. And I, I shared with uh, the director, I shared with my principals, and I even shared with parents that I would do the report up to the point where I was unable to do any of the testing. And I would write in my summary that uh, at this point, we are not able to make a determination as to if the student is eligible because I'm able to administer certain testing materials that need to be administered. And then we would kind of leave it 
as a dangling participle, <laughs> as a dangling participle for as a, as a, 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 a analogy until we're able to come back to the table and complete testing. And that's kind of how uh, it is. We did, if you go back to the first slide and read under the IDEA, IDEA legislation, it speaks about waivers that we have been given with timelines. For example, these students are out of school due to an emergency. Initially, it talked about 10 days, but now it's saying that those days have been extended uh, until we have a definitive day that students are to return to school. So uh, back to you, the question, I would not do testing if I uh, don't have that proctor available to help me or have that kid in front of me. And right now with social distancing laws, um, <clears throat> it's not a safe, <laughs> safe environment for me. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm in the, I'm in the, I'm in the at risk range uh, at 60 and over. So I don't think um, I would do any testing face to face right now. Thank so, you. I appreciate that. That's very yeah. helpful. All right. Thank you, Ms. Han. Can you, here's a question from Ms. Brown. Can you request information through questionnaires to teachers for classroom observation? Teachers can give information on how the student performs in the class and what they have observed. Yeah, but by law, we have to do three observations across the curriculum when we're doing an initial evaluation and two for our triennials. And I would never rely on anyone else to give me information regarding my observation. Um, I'm sure you, if, you, if you think it's something that you'd like to do and could get away with, uh, by all means, but I, I don't think that's best practice. When I put the document cam in the classroom, uh, or actually it wasn't even a document cam, the teacher had a laptop and it had a cam at the top of the uh, portion of the laptop when you open it, as most do. And she set it on top of the shelf where I could see the entire classroom, in particular where the kid was seated. And I got a very good observation in the classroom for an hour. And then I had her take it into the cafeteria and place it in a uh, place that was as conspicuous that the kid couldn't see, didn't know what was going on, uh, where it couldn't be knocked over or bothered by other students. And I was able to make a very, do a very good observation there. So again, I, observations are not difficult to happen as long as you can uh, have the teacher place the document cam where you need it. But my question, uh, Ms. Brown, is it has to be in the educational environment. I understand that they're, in, that they're not there anymore and they're at home. So that leads me to is an observation in the home the same as doing an observation in the school? And I would say no, traditionally, because at home, the kid is in his environment, he's safer, he feels more comfortable and he's not going to be that same kid that he is at school either due to peer pressure uh teacher administrators whatever he's not going to be the same kid at home that he is at school so my question back to you is for thought is are you getting a truly good observation that you need to make an informed decision about making an eligibility determination with this student so again i would uh would really wait until i'm able to get a really good observation miss brown Before we wrap up, we only have a few minutes. If you wanted to show everybody your resources, then you can do a screen share. Oh, sure. Okay, I'll pull those up. Thank you so much. Sure. All right, here's the first one. This is um, actually- I think you might have to reshare your screen there, Kevin. Oh, I am, I'm, yeah, I will. I'm uh, trying Perfect, to thank you. make sure I get it up right for you guys. <laughs>
this is this is actually uh, some reinforcer activities for telehealth, and it's quite a few as you see um, websites that have different games, if you may, puzzles, uh, activities, uh, things therapists can do with uh, their students, uh, educational websites, uh, Khan Academy. I don't know if you guys have heard of that one. I'm sure it's a pretty uh, big one. Um, but this is one of the, the uh, one of my sort lists that I was typing up to kind of share with you guys. I haven't quite finished it yet, but um, with a lot of resources to uh, access to help you keep your kid motivated, reinforced, and you know, share. Hey, if if I can get you guys to if get you through this, we'll play this game or we'll do this activity. This is a really good uh, list of things that I've used uh, since I've been doing teletherapy. Um, and uh, I will be willing to share this with you guys as well. Um, I have another one that I'd like to share with you. All right, let me get that one up for you. And this is the other, the other site that I, I have. And this particular site is, um, let me share it with you. This particular site is a virtual website where you can take a kid to the San Diego Zoo, Yellowstone National Park, a trip on Mars. Uh, and these are the kind of th things that kids will ask you after you've shared this stuff with them a time or two. And they'll even ask you after a session is over, Mr. Whitfield, can we go back to the zoo? I want to see the panda bears or whatever it is. Uh, but they actually, it, it's very good to motivate the students with and particular your behavioral type kids um, that are ADHD, um, some of my ED kids, they really, I really am able to use these websites with them to help motivate them, keep them on task and uh, keep them functioning well. So those are, those are the two websites that I was speaking of that I wanted to share with you guys. Um, and without further ado, if there, if there are any other questions, um, I appreciate you guys coming in. Uh, please excuse uh, my gruff appearance. I haven't been able to visit a barber in uh, over two months now. <laughs> and uh, I don't like shaving myself. Um, and again, this is the virtual background I was speaking of, of earlier. And I know you guys, I saw some folks using it. So I know you're pretty familiar with it. And of course, you can always go in there and take it off. And I, I personally, uh, as I said, um, you don't use these, but uh, my background um, is um, kind of distracting for my students. So I put up a white screen and cover it with something that, that matches my skin tone so that I come across on the uh, screen very well. Not to say that I do my skin tones because, uh, uh, but as you see, I have a lot of stuff in the background. It's pretty noisy, I call it. And it can be kind of distracting to a kid, so I don't use them. So that said, I uh, thank you for your time. If there are no other questions, I really appreciate you guys. Thank you, Kevin. We really appreciate your time today. And thank you everyone for joining. Have a wonderful weekend. Thank you, Flavia. Thank you. Have a wonderful day, Geneva. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yeah.